Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to teach you about Mary Bibb, a teacher, editor, and a homemaker. She was an activist in mid-19th century Canada and a very important figure in Canadian history. Firstly, we are going to take a brief look at the early life of Mary Bibb. Mary was born Mary Elizabeth Miles to free black Quaker parents in the year 1820. Born on Rhode Island in the United States of America, of which there is a map to the right of this slide, Rhode Island was a northern state, and because she was born to free parents, Mary never experienced slavery in her lifetime, though it was still prominent in the United States. It is likely that Mary started teaching as a teenager, as this was normal and expected of women and teachers at the time. You would start by teaching and go to school for it later. Mary was also born an only child. As mentioned on the previous slide, after a few years of teaching, Mary decided to go to school to learn how to be a better teacher. In her late teens or early 20s, Mary attended the Massachusetts State Normal School, an institution for educating would-be teachers. The principal at the time, Reverend Samuel Joseph May, was an abolitionist and was involved with and helped in the Underground Railroad, helping escape slaves to freedom in the Northern States or eventually in Canada. He was also a supporter of women's, black, and public education. It is at this school and under the guidance of May that Mary likely started to get involved in activism. It is most likely that she received the highest level of education and took the highest level of courses that were available at the normal school, as evidenced by her later teaching position in a very prestigious high school in Cincinnati. After receiving her education at the normal school, Mary supported herself for years as a teacher. Moving around the northern states and teaching at schools primarily for black children, Mary was able to live an independent lifestyle and did not rely on her parents or anybody else to make her living. Teaching was one of the only ways that women, especially black women in the 19th century, would have been able to support themselves. At 28, Mary returned to Boston in order to marry Henry Bibb. On this slide, you can see a newspaper announcement detailing their marriage. Bibb was a, an escaped slave, an activist, an author, and a lecturer. He had wrote a book detailing his life experiences. Mary and Henry shared similar interests in regards to advancing Black rights and improving Black lives in the Americas. They lived in Boston for several years after they were married. In 1850, two years after Mary's marriage, the United States government passed the Fugitive Slave Act. This act allowed for bounty hunters and others to go into the northern states and kidnap both escaped slaves and free black people and return them to enslavement in the southern states. This led to many people fleeing to Canada, including Mary and her husband, who, along with his mother, were escaped slaves. They became part of a mass exodus into Canada, where they would be safer than they were in the northern states. The Bibbs first arrived in Sandwich, a small town in southern Ontario near the border. And immediately upon arrival, Mary and her husband started community building efforts in an effort to help the disadvantaged Black community already living in Sandwich. The first thing Mary did was open a school, and then she helped Henry, her husband, to found a newspaper, The Voice of the Fugitive. On this slide, you will see an article from The Voice of the Fugitive on January 1st, 1851, detailing what Black education was like in Canada. While segregated schools were not mandated by law, they were allowed by it, and the School Act of 1848 gave white parents and school organizers an excuse to force segregation.
In Sandwich, there was no school set up for black children, so when Mary and her husband arrived, they were unable to receive an education. Having a teaching background, Mary decided to remedy this and set up a school. Originally, it was held in the front room of her home and 25 students attended. They did eventually get a school building, but no funding or resources were provided to them as this was a black school and not a white one. Mary was responsible for teaching, uptake, and to buy anything that the school needed while not receiving a salary for her work. Students were, expected to, were asked to pay six cents a week. However, most could not afford this and were not turned away. Education was viewed as a very important in the black, communi black community. It broke the pattern of poverty and allowed for advancement through society, which was unable to happen without it. And that is why Mary's first school and all her schools were considered so important and why historian Afua Cooper considers her teaching her most important contribution to black public life in Canada. Eventually, the stress of being the sole person responsible for this school led to Mary having to give it up. The school was passed on to another teacher and did not close for a few decades. When her and her husband relocated to nearby Windsor, Mary was able to open up a second school. After receiving no help for the, from the government on her first public school, this school was private and was funded by the well-established wealthier black families in Windsor. Her second school was integrated at some point, and there was a record of nine white children who attended. While this is not a picture of her class, it is a picture from a few decades after Mary's school would have been opened of a separate integrated class, showing what education should have been like in Canada from the beginning. Mary believed in integration, however, because of the circumstances she faced, most of her schools were mainly attended by black children. It is unclear when Mary gave up teaching at this second school. However, eventually she did open a thought and the two of these schools were much more successful than her first attempt in Sandwich. Mary did not only teach at these schools, however, on the weekends, she also taught at Sunday schools at her church and did not only teach Bible lessons, but also offered lessons in reading and writing to those who would not have otherwise been able to access it. Even though teaching was likely her biggest support to Black public lives in Canada, it was in no way her only community building effort. Almost immediately upon arriving in Canada, Mary and her husband founded the Refugee Home Society. This was a society which was focused on aiding Black refugees from the United States to find homes. They would buy land and set up refugees, home or settlements, including one settlement or community entirely lived in by fugitive slaves. Mary was the secretary of the Refugee Home Society and instrumental in gaining access to the land which they used. The voice of the fugitive was used as almost a spokesperson for this society and it would give minutes and details about the club. It is from one of these pages of the Voice of the Fugitive that we know Mary was the secretary of the society. Her and her husband, in a similar effort, were also involved in the Underground Railroad and would sometimes house escaped slaves from the United States upon their arrival in Canada. Marianne Chad, another prominent Black woman in Canada in the 19th century, shared several similarities with Mary Bibb. They were both school teachers, and Chad also founded an abolitionist newspaper entitled The Provincial Freeman. In 
They had both immigrated from the United States to Canada. However, both women had different ideas about how to deal with the racism they faced in Canada. Marianne Shad was a staunch advocate for integration and refused to accept anything less. Unlike Mary, who was all right with teaching in segregated schools and setting up separate communities like the Refugee Home Society Settlement in order to walk around the racism which they faced, Mary Ann Chad was not willing to do this. She used her newspaper to advocate against things like this, like the settlement of the Refugee Home Society. And Mary and Chad and Mary Bibb engaged in public debates, mostly via their two newspapers. As I mentioned before, upon arrival in Canada, Henry Bibb, Mary's husband, almost immediately founded a newspaper. This was an abolitionist newspaper entitled The Voice of the Fugitive, and it is likely that Mary was hugely involved in its creation and production. She had more education than her husband and likely edited the newspaper, as many of the articles read more like her own letters than like her husband's when they are compared. The newspaper advocated for the advancement of black rights, paying special attention to those of fugitives. It was popular throughout the Americas, which, with subscriptions being filled not only outside of Ontario in Canada, but also across many of the northern states of the U.S. The newspaper was in support for and advocated for several advancement of black rights, including the abolition of slavery, black education, black agriculture, moral reform, temperance, and Canadian immigration. When Henry left to do lecture tours in 1851 across the states in Canada, Mary was left in charge of the newspaper and was responsible for it. Abolitionist newspapers such as these were important for the building of the black community and for the advancement of black rights as they were all the spokespersons for the civil rights movement, which came much, much later. On this slide, you will see a sign for the Mary E. Bibb Park, which sits on one of the sites used by the Refugee Home Society. This park proves Mary's enduring importance as a historical figure in Canada. Not only was she a teacher, an activist, and, and helped to make homes for those arriving in Canada from the States, her and Mary Shad also put Black women at the forefront of this community building. For a group which had most of their agency in the Americas stripped away from them during enslavement when they could not even be in charge of their own bodies and who faced the addition of misogyny on top of racism, to have them at the forefront of the community was very important. The Black community in Ontario would not be the same without her community building efforts.